would, I mean, Alexander Graham Bell probably would have been surprised, right? Right. <laughs> Good. So, looks like it's going to rain. It, when I had lunch, uh, there was a couple drops, and it was around uh, 1230, and then it, that was it, you know. Huh. Okay, no rush. Do you mind waiting a second? No, not at all. I don't think it's supposed to rain until uh, Thursday. Thursday? Okay. Yeah, it's supposed to be like 80 tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in Indian Dutchess. summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm loving it. I know. I wish I was uh, not campaigning and yeah. was out kayaking or hiking or something. So where do you live? I live in Pleasant Valley. Oh, you do? Yep. I live in Wappenders. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, you go to Hall every day? Yeah. <laughs> so how close are they? They're probably 20 minutes, half an hour. Yeah. I grew up in East Fishkill, though. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, where? Uh, Lomala, between Fishkill and East Fishkill. I went to, uh, oh, okay. went to Brent Croft, Van White, John Jay. Okay. Yeah. You know. And I drive around there all the time. So that's Pat Manning territory, right? Uh, yep, was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's still around. He's he's now, I think, in Beacon. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. He is a Beacon? No, Beacon. Beacon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. He's a Beacon. It's a sad ear of mine. Yeah. Beacon of Hope, you know. Did he start in, uh, like, on, in the town board there or something? I don't know his political history. I know he was assemblyman when I was uh, young, and I just remember seeing the name. I think, he was a, I think he was a county legislator at one point, but I could be wrong, uh -huh. you know. But I don't know his yeah. full history. Yeah. I actually, I, I, I knew about him, but I never actually met him until uh, several years back, uh, three years ago, he actually was um, the candidate for, for assembly. Uh, this was before the redistricting. And there was a question of his residency because he had been, this was after he was in the assembly and he left, and then he was, he was coming, trying to come back. And he had lived in Massachusetts for a time, and there was a question of his residency. And I actually became, he called me up, I was his attorney. And I argued the fact that he had, he had ties to the area because he still had his kids. He had been divorced from his wife and all that. Uh, even though he was living in Massachusetts, he still had enough ties, is what I argued, and we actually won the case that he was. Uh, wow. New York has a residency requirement; you have to have five years in the district before you can um, run for an office. We learned that with Teach Out. Yeah. <laughs> this was when he was running for governor. No, no, he was assembly. Then he ran for governor, and by running for governor, he lost. Mark Molinaro came in and challenged him for the right. assembly, so yeah. he lost that, yeah. and he felt his and his and his marriage went down the drain so he kind of felt he lost everything he moved to St. Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts and was living there and um, and working there but because he in all fact he had moved there but because he still had um, you know kids that were in high school and for his family court he maintained a residence for them to come oh, visit him when he, and so uh, he five years pass on he no longer there he moves back to New York and he sees an opportunity to get back involved in politics so he runs for the assembly this was it had to be two years ago, and um, and so two years ago he ran for the assembly, got the nomination of the party, but he still had a lot of enemies politically. So people were saying, "Well, look, you're not even eligible. You don't live. You don't meet this requirement." So within the party, they decided, "Let's settle this issue in June rather than having it be an issue come November." So they was a, there was a, he was sued by party officials, but it was a friendly fight. And then he, did, he, he called me up and asked if I would be the attorney. And I had never really met him prior to that. And, and um, so I, you know, I said to him, and it looked as if he was going to lose. Yeah. And nobody would yeah. represent him. Thank you. In case you need that. Thank you. So I, I kind of said, you know, look, Pat, I'll, I'll give you your day in court. But then as I learned more and more, I ended up coming to, you know, argue and win. So how are you? How are you? Good. I'm Mark Michael Piscara. Nice to meet you. Michael. I'm Teresa Hyman, the executive Thank editor. Thank you, Teresa. Good. Right. I wish I could sit down in this, but unfortunately I've got a conflict. But I want oh, okay. to say hello and uh, put a face behind the name. Good, so, good. You have a good time. Where were you? Go get my card. Uh, <laughs> it's about the only good thing that came out of that. Okay. Sitting in the sun. Good, so, good. All right. So, do he, so, who would he run against? He, there was, he had ran, this was, there was a primary, and he ended up running for, um, he had the nomination, but Kieran Lowler and Rich Wager were both vying for it as well. And then come primary, Kieran Lowler beat him in the primary. So Kieran Lowler, oh, then yeah. even though Pat was the nominee, Kieran Lowler became won by primary. Kieran Lowler is the current assemblyman. Oh. So he's 
So this is down way down there. This was uh, Southern Duchess, the mm -hmm. six, My territory. eight towns or so mm -hmm. down there. Mm -hmm. So that's he like, used to be our assembly. He did. The district used yeah. to be. It used to go East Fishkill, and it went all the way up Harlem Valley and Duchess, and then mm -hmm. and then also uh, Eastern Columbia, and then went and went over, and and Hudson, and then I think I think it had I don't know all the towns. I think it had Greenport. I think it had did it have Stockport. I'm not sure, but it it, it was a weird shaped. Uh, and it went over to got Red Hook, which is where Mark Molinaro was, and so in my, I mean, it was a weird shaped district. So. Are we out? Oh yeah. Oh okay. Oh, that's been recorded. Oh, you've been taping. You got my everything. You got them coming. Got my love <laughs> story. Yeah. I was just making conversations. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. You're on, John. You're on, John. Uh huh. Yep. You're on. Um, so, what do you? Uh, why did you decide to run? Uh, I'm, I'm, I jumped in the race in May, and largely the uh, the biggest issue that's always been on my mind, uh, why I ran for county legislator five years ago, and why I'm, I'm running for assembly now, is it revolves around mental health. Uh, my mom has a schizophrenia, and when she's needed to have uh, receive help in the community, the services haven't been there. Uh, there's a lack of hospital beds, uh, and the trend has been uh, when the economy is tough and the budgets are bad, they cut from mental health funding, uh, and I see the, the negativity of that in the services. Um, specifically this past year, uh, or specifically with this governor, we saw the closure three years ago of the Hudson River Psych Center, um, and my mom had been a patient there when, uh, back when I was a little kid, I remember visiting her there, uh, and they also, the counties were stripped of their authority uh, over uh, mental hygiene, and now they're reduced to a consultant role, uh, and I saw a lot of this taking place, and I was a county legislator uh, to maintain the mental health services we have, uh, and now the counties really don't have a role anymore. And so I see that as uh, my interest in the state is to try to make a, uh, contribute to the policy on mental health. I really don't believe we have one. And specifically, we had in Dutchess County this past year, we had the, the, the Dutchess County energy tax uh, uh, that I was against, I voted against it, uh, and it was eventually repealed. Uh, it came about as a repeal uh, due to money that was given to the county uh, uh, by uh, the assemblywoman that I'm running against. Uh, and while that was good, it, the money came from money that was earmarked for mental hygiene. Uh, and it was for the whole region, not just Dutchess, but Columbia and Ulster. Uh, and so now that money went directly to uh, curing the, the deficit in the Dutchess County budget. Okay, I, I'm behind you. Yep. Okay, so um, the, 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 the governor, uh, uh, whatever his name is, Cuomo, Cuomo. Uh, pulled up the money away from mental health funding. In, in previous budgets, there has been, uh, they closed Hudson River Psych Center. Um, and money, uh, and, and at the same time, uh, diluted the power of counties. Uh, formerly, counties uh, ran mental hygiene departments. They oversaw uh, mental health within the community. Now that's no longer the case. Now counties are consultants. So there's been a trend um, to take money away from serving the mentally ill in the community. They outsourced it to private companies? Now, many of the clinics have privatized. In Dutchess, for instance, the, it used to be the, the county-ran clinics. Now mm -hmm. it's privatized. Um, and that, that may not necessarily be a, um, a um, Cuomo, I'm not really sure. They, did, they have removed the counties. It's now um, behavioral health organizations are the ones that are running, uh, determining the care that the mentally ill receive. It used to be the counties had a role and they would manage them. Now the, the counties are really just um, uh, consultants. And at Dutchess, uh, they're moving towards merging mental hygiene with health department because what is the need anymore? It's no, it's no longer, their role is no longer what it used to be. So somebody like the Mental Health Association, is that who's talking about? Uh, no, the Mental Health Association, that would be like a nonprofit. Uh, I, and I used to work for People Incorporated, a, a, a also a uh, mental health um, provider. Um, it, and there are, there are clinics that are run, um, but there were county clinics as well. And now it, it used to be funded by... Um, Give me the name. Uh, come to me, Linda. Now it, it moved over to Pros, uh, Personal Recovery Oriented Service, and it used to have a former name. I'm forgetting what it was. But the whole thing, the, the where it used to be managed by the county, is now gone to behavioral health organizations, mm -hmm. and individual nonprofits can bid on that uh, within different counties. So it's not uniform. I believe. Uh, it, I believe in Duchess. It may be 
uh, MHA that may be doing, and I know that they're setting up at health homes. It's it's coming at the same time as the um, Affordable Care Act with health homes, and so there is a lot of overlap. Uh, but the main thing is, it's no longer the county's running it; it's now been privatized. So, th how does that relate to the energy tax? Because this has been going on, this trend has been uh, to move uh, resources away from the mentally ill uh, to cure budget deficits on the state level. And then in this past year, Dutchess County uh, had a deficit, a shortfall in revenue, uh, and the energy tax was the solution offered by the county executive. Uh, and that was implemented in March, uh, and there was a great public uh, uproar and outcry, and in an effort to, the county executive said he would remove that if, if mandate relief came from Albany. Uh, and there was a lobbying attempt to the state legislators to provide mandate relief. Uh, no mandate relief came, but uh, one of our senators and one of our assemblywomen uh, brought forth uh, several million, uh, three and a half million this year, one and a half towards next year. <coughs> state budget cycles, April to, you know, it's... So Dee Dee Barrett and Kathy Marchand? No, um, uh, Greg Ball. Greg Ball and... Uh, and Dee Dee Barrett. And Dee Dee Barrett. They, where did they get the money? The money was earmarked in the governor's budget for mental health for the Hudson Valley. And so in setting the budget, they took the money that was intended to go for mental health services in the Hudson Valley mm -hmm. and put it towards Dutchess County's budget. Mm -hmm. Have you worked very closely with Ball? No. I've known him, but I don't really have much interaction with him. Curious. So he's a Republican? Yeah. He's a Republican. He represents in Dutchess, he represents uh, Pauling and Beekman, just a s very small section. And and the bulk of the county, he used to he used to represent, before redistricting, he used to represent Amenia, which is one of the mm -hmm. towns I represent, so I had some interaction with him, um, but it was really just seeing him at a parade or, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and you said you represent, no, I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a county legislator. Um, oh, okay. right. I live in Pleasant Valley and I represent Pleasant Valley. I represent the uh, town of Washington and the village of Millbrook, which is not in this assembly district, I rep and I represent Amenia, which is, and I formally represented Stanford for four years, and that is in the district, but now county legislative, it's no longer my county legislative district, but it is in assembly district. So it's a kind of a skinny district that goes along you know, Connecticut, sort of. The my district yeah. it goes from it's it goes from the center of the county, which is Pleasant Valley, straight over east to Connecticut right. border, okay. and it's got that chunk in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Um, a lot of detail. Yeah. <laughs> um, why don't you just um, tell us a little bit about your Stamps on the Common Core? Okay, uh, I, I I am a teacher. I teach at Marist College as a uh, as an adjunct. Um, so what do you I teach? I teach uh, philosophy. Oh, really? I teach, uh, currently teaching two sections of it now. Uh, so I understand, uh, you know, what teachers are saying when they need to have control over their curriculum and they need to be able to uh, teach different ways to different students. Uh, I don't think the Common Core allows a lot of latitude for that. Um, and I also have issues that it's, it, it seems to cut out the role of parents and the local community uh, to contribute towards it. Um, so I see that there's issues with it. Um, Philosophically, I have issues with the federal government uh, setting the educational standards. I believe in our constitution, it's, it should be set to the state. Uh, and I think there, while there was always areas for improvement, I think the state and the local school district, districts are in the best position to be de determining curriculum. What about the argument that um, when people, you know, they go from one state to another, then they have they get, um, what's it called, in the Twilight Zone or something. I, I you know, I, I respect home rule, and, so, and, and there can be differences. I don't think everything should be the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think it, you know, that there are good things and bads with, with having diversity, but I think, uh, uh, I think local, each local community should be, should, is the best authority for what their kids are being taught. Um, so, so students who just have to catch up or something like that move. No, it's not, not so much get, catch up. Uh, you know, I, I think that there is educational standards. I think are 
commonplace. I, you know, I think every, you know, you're not going to see much differences, but you will see uh, differences in, you know, emphasis or, um, you know, and, and New York as a, as a whole had, uh, you know, has our educational standards, you know, that, so I don't think there's that many differences between the state. I mean, if somebody's coming from Connecticut to, to New York, I doubt there'd be much difference anyway. What do you think sets you apart from D.D. Barrett? I think I have, um, I've, I've struggled in my life. Um, my childhood was, was difficult uh, in that uh, my dad lost his job in the 92 recession. Uh, the following year, he came down with, uh, unexpectedly came down with cancer and passed away. Uh, and our family went from being middle class to being poor. Uh, we, we stayed for five years, we stayed afloat due to the uh, contributions from, our food, from local food pantries. Um, that, on top of my mom's mental illness, there's been a lot of struggle, and, and I've seen, uh, I think a lot of people in the community do struggle, whether it's with uh, health issues, whether it's with uh, um, job loss, um, economic things, and I think that I can relate to people uh, in a way that maybe she can't, um, because when I legislate or even as an attorney, I'm representing people who are, who are facing tough times, whether it's eviction or foreclosure or whatever it might be, and all those experiences, both ones that I've lived personally as well as those I've encountered, uh, helps me and influences me when I'm voting on laws, when I'm passing budgets, uh, when, when proposals are brought forward such as the energy tax or tax on clothing, and I can sit there and I can, from the perspective of, you know, how is this going to affect the people I represent, uh, I think I'm in touch with them, and, and I'm not sure she is. Where do you stand on the whole, the governor's whole energy, uh, you know, the power yeah. lines and everything? I, I you know, with, with the power lines, uh, I'm, I'm not sure there's a need for it. I think he is thinking ahead and saying, well, there will be down the road. Um, and there's two forums coming up, uh, one on Saturday and, uh, and one following week, um, asking this question, it, 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 are they even needed? Is the energy needed? Um, if it is, um, uh, you know, and I think we're right to be looking ahead to say, is there a need, you know, uh, but we also have to be looking upon the impact it has upon the people's households, uh, property values. Um, and, and I think if we're going to look ahead as energy needed, we also need to look at the mechanism. Uh, I have, I kind of think down the road, you know, in the not too distant future, we'll be looking back and looking at power lines and say, what was that? I can't believe they had that back then. Um, you know, the move is on for wireless and that's communication, but not with energy. Um, but I really think if we're going to be moving forward, we really should be looking at burying them, looking underground. Mm -hmm. And I realize it is expensive, um, but I, I think if we're going to, the impact of, of these tall towers will affect uh, property values. Uh, the various corridors that they're looking at, which might expand in some of the plans and, and put them in new areas, that's going to impact people's way of life. It's going to impact their, their property values. Um, so I think we need to look at all of that, not just is there a need. Uh, I think we need to look at how we're going to go about doing it. And then the issue of how do you pay for it. Um, you know, I don't think a rate increase is necessarily the way to go. I, I think you have to look at... Um, you know, who's going to benefit from it? Is it going to be primarily for New York City, just like the reservoirs of, of centuries past, you know, you had entire towns buried in the Catskills um, to serve water purposes uh, for New York. If that's going to be for the city, then we should look at a way for them to pay for it. Um, perhaps similar to the, the, the MTA, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, that, you know, in Dutchess, we pay, our businesses pay taxes for that, which is, you know, the train. If we're looking at not just transportation, but as energy, should we be looking at a funding system that way? So there's a lot involved, um, but I don't, I don't think, I don't think we've, uh, I don't think the government has, and has seriously vetted and looked through all of the various issues. Well, look at what FERC did; they mm -hmm. raised the prices. How do you feel about that? I, I, I also have an issue with that. I think one, you have FERC, you have an. Um, uh, an agency making decisions where I, I really think it should be the representatives who are elected to represent us and, and, and are accountable to the people making the decisions, not necessarily an agency. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, it's the idea of we're going to we're going to tax you now because there's going to be a need down the road and expand it. Uh, I think I think it's backwards. Um, I, you have to be looking at yes, you want to look at our energy needs and demands down the road. Uh, but at the same time, you also have to look at the energy sources and saying, well, you know, can we promote more uh, green, you know, uh, whether it's wind or solar, uh, and how do you do that? Um, you know, so I, I think taxing us is, is just to set up a pool of money. I don't think that's the way to go. What about fracking? 
Uh, fracking, uh, I read the court decision that came out, um, and with, with fracking, I, I, you know, what you're doing is you're balancing, you know, the environmental risks uh, and public health, as well as uh, the other side of the argument is that we need jobs, and, and this is an opportunity to, uh, um, to stimulate the economy. Um, there's good arguments on both sides, um, and, and, and I think that as a society, and scientists are researching them and saying, is this safe, uh, uh, and is it a you know, are there jobs and is um, e economical. Um, the court decision that came out uh, representing two towns, one in Tompkins County, one up by Cooperstown, uh, suggested that it should be that local controls, local municipalities have the ability to um, decide for themselves. Um, and, and I would support that. I think that through the secret process, through public participation, that if a town uh, is you know, sees they have a need for jobs. And some of the towns I represent uh, in Amenia, uh, there's there's not a job base, and they had they went through this with a quarry, and they decided, you know, so an excavator came and said, I want a quarry, and they went through the process, and in the end, they decided we're going to have a quarry in our town, um, and 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 I think that was their decision to make. And I think there are some towns uh, that have said we don't want to allow fracking. We think it's a public risk uh, to health, uh, to the environment and that's, they pass laws. I think other towns may say we want the jobs, we want, you know, we need that. I think if you go through the local process, allowing the people that will be directly influenced um, is the way to go. Uh, and by having it at a state level, I think it's harder for the person to travel to Albany or have their voice heard when it's easier for them to go to the town hall. But isn't they, don't the effects spill over? There, there is. I mean, there is, there is. And, and the question would be, what would you say to the person who lives just over the town border? Um, and, and I think that person still could participate in a, in a, in a um, public hearing, uh, even though they don't get the vote. Um, but I do think that we do have home rule in, in New York, and I do think that's important uh, to consider. Um, what, um, what do you see as opportunities to increase economic development? The um, my philosophy with 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 economics is is that I think a, a lot of times government um, needs to to step back um, and we, by stepping back I think you need to let the free market grow um, and with that I think you need there's you know regulations we have to be careful in what we're doing um, that sometimes we put too much regulations in place that hamper um, the ability for business to grow. Um, and that can be with taxation, it can also be with, with licensing requirements. Uh, we had an assisted living facility down in, in, uh, in Millbrook, um, that uh, founds at Millbrook, and they wanted to expand. And there's a great need for, uh, you know, as older populations growing, there's, there's more population. They wanted to expand, but the licensing requirement was so difficult that they were having trouble doing that. So I, th I think we need to look at our laws um, to, you know, sometimes the laws get passed, they have a purpose, uh, but we don't always put sunsets on them, and sometimes they stay on the books too long. I think that if we put sunsets in laws, uh, we're careful with our regulations, I think you can allow, um, it can free up businesses. Um, uh, so so I would, my approach would be more for the government to take a step back, free up regulations. Um, I don't like the fact of government picking winners and losers, um, uh, which happens a lot when, there, when there's uh, pilots and, and tax incentives given uh, to businesses. We do need to recruit them, but we, we need a good business environment. Um, and that, I think, will, will allow businesses to come. We also have to be careful of our property tax uh, in New York. Our property taxes, I think, is a deterrent for businesses to locate. It, you know, if you're going to come here and our property taxes are so high and you could go somewhere else where they're not, uh, you know, we need a more friendlier business climate. Do you think is, do you have an alternative to the property tax? Uh, I, I do. Um, I believe that an income tax is more equitable. Um, I believe property tax system is based upon uh, your value at one point. You could afford this property at some time, uh, and then property values tend to, to, to grow or lower. Um, but your own position, whether you lose, have a job loss, whether you retire, um, when you're pro taxing somebody on their property, it's a, it's it's even though it can climb and, and you're, it's the same level, and it doesn't necessarily reflect your ability to pay. Um, I think an income tax is a more just and equitable uh, way of, of determining wealth. Um, tax, you know, your income changes from year to year. Uh, many people it grows. Sometimes it, it goes down for job loss or for uh, 
uh, retirement. And, and so I, I think we need to move away from property taxes. Whether we do that all, I think maybe a hybrid between property and income, but eventually I think you need to uh, um, phase out property tax as a system of collection. What, is, what issues in Columbia County do you see as being different from what you're dealing with in Dutchess? The, uh, the SAFE Act is definitely uh, a larger concern. I hear that more on the doors when I knock on, on here. There's a lot of people, I think a lot more um, um, gun owners in, um, in Columbia County than I see in Dutchess. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, and, and, and there, there is, a lot of this district is rural, even in Dutchess, so it, I think it just might be a, um, I don't know, a geographical difference, but, but the SAFE Act is, is brought up a lot more by people I, uh, when I'm knocking on doors and, and I ask them what's on their mind. Um, uh, so I see that. Um, agriculture is an issue um, throughout, um, you know, the, the ability of farms to continue, um, you know, and then and taxes is, is the number one thing that people bring up that they're concerned about. What's your stance on the SAFE Act? I think it came about in the wrong way, um, and I would seek to repeal it. I, I believe that uh, um, you, you can have a discussion on gun control, um, but the discussion wasn't had. Um, and I think that the SAFE Act came about uh, as a result of, um, <clears throat> as a, a knee-jerk reaction to Newtown. And with Newtown, I think it goes back to, to mental health. Um, I, re I really think that we need, we have a mental health crisis in this country. I think it affects so many different areas and we don't have a policy on it. And, and I would have liked, especially with what happened in Newtown and whether it was there or whether it was you know, the, the cinema shooting or whatever, um, we need to be addressing prevention and intervention, uh, you know, especially in the schools. Um, and instead, the gun control uh, through the SAFE Act came about. And I, and I think you can have a conversation on gun control, but we have yet to have that conversation on mental health. But, but the SAFE Act does have a mental health provision. It, it has a provision that a, a counts if you go to see a therapist and they judge your danger to yourself or to others that they have to report it. Um, that was already in case law, so it, it didn't change anything. All it did was was put into statute what was previously said by a judge you have to do. There's already a requirement that if a therapist or, or, or a nurse practitioner or a doctor thinks you're going to be a threat, they already have to report it. The case law said to the authorities, the SAFE Act has you go to the Commissioner of Mental Hygiene. Um, so it so that had that one provision, but it didn't change anything from what was already taking place, uh, and it doesn't address the issues of of um, of how do we detect mental health, how do we provide treatment, how do we provide care. The the shooter in Newtown afterwards, everybody said, oh, he had issues. We could see it, you know, from his teachers to you know, even you know, I guess there was um, information about the mother was trying to get him into treatment or something, but it was undet. It, it, even though it may have been detected, it wasn't being treated. There wasn't there was an at-risk person, or and there's individuals that we don't um, we don't treat, and we don't have the the, abil the ability within the community. You need a continuum of care. There's different people at different stages. You need hospitals. You need partial hospitalizations. You need uh, daycare services, therapists, um, support systems, and we don't have that. And so even if somebody is in need of it, they're not getting the care they need. Instead, uh, our response to society is we wait for something to happen and then we put them in jail and our jails are being filled with with people who uh, have mental health diagnosis or addiction uh, in Dutchess County it's about 75 percent and if we could just spend a portion of that money that we're now spending on jail uh, costs on prevention we could avoid that we increase the dignity of the person make the community safer uh, and really deal tackle with the problem instead we wait they go to our jail uh, and to me, that's, that's backwards. And, and meanwhile, the people who are in jail are there for a crime, but if we could have prevented that crime by dealing with the real issues, I think in, in the whole scheme, we would be much better off. I'll drink some water while we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Agri You know what? It's... <clears throat> You don't sound like a Republican, like a typical Republican. It, it, and, 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 and I've gotten that before. Um, both my parents are Democrats, all four of my grandparents are Democrats, and it, and it really is a, um, uh, you know, your product of your influence. Um, I, I, I don't, I talk about the issues that I know appeals to Democrats, but, it, but, it, but there's, it's a commonality between, regardless of the party. The reason I'm a Republican is, is I don't believe government is a solution. I don't believe, I don't look at government to provide all the solutions. I think government has a role. But I think society has to be the one that's going to solve so the social problems. And with that, I mean, you, you nonprofits, the churches, you know, neighbors, 
when I go door to door uh, campaigning, I, I bring um, grocery bags and I ask people to fill them up with food, take them to the local food pantry and give them directions because we all have the ability and it's really a challenge basically to everybody that look, we can help solve the problems if we all come together, not just say, oh, somebody else is going to take care of it because somebody else tends to be the government. And then my tax money, your tax money goes towards this. When If we all chip in, we could lower the tax burden because we're all feeding feeding the hungry. And I use that as an example. But I think a lot of it is, um, you know, the stuff that the government does today, social welfare, a lot of it, you know, the churches used to provide, you know, and, and if we empower them or we empower the nonprofits, uh, I think we're in a better position. I, I mentioned earlier, I worked a couple of years for a mental health nonprofit. And, you know, you see the numbers, the, we could provide services at a cheaper rate than government could. And, and so there is some value in, in to this idea of privatization, but the issue, somebody still needs to be overseeing it. And that was my problem earlier with the county used to have mental hygiene oversight. Now they don't. Somebody has to manage it so that there is uh, systems moving, but everybody has a role. Okay. Agriculture. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm for agriculture. Okay, that's good. <laughs> the, the, the big issue I hear talking to, and, and my county legislative district is, is, has, it's um, one of two districts that have most of the farms in Dutchess County, so I'm, I'm well versed on it. I'm in the, the, the board of directors Cornell Cooperative. Um, you know, I interact with farmers on a regular basis. The, um, the issue that I hear from farmers, I mean, there's a number of issues, but one of them is that, you know, they're, they tend to be um, uh, land rich, and, and, uh, and therefore, when you have property taxes, they, they're getting hit because they have all these property, um, large properties, so therefore the tax is higher. Um, there's a lot going on with conservation easements, and a lot of them are applying for them. Um, and, and that's good, uh, because we need to give them some areas where they can have um, you know, the relief because we, we need to promote, we need our farms, we need to promote, uh, you know, good, safe food locally um, and and the way we can help the farmer going forward because they're, they're not making a lot of money, you know, they're main, a lot of the money that they have, or the crops they have end up going out and the, the branders and the marketers and the retailers are making the money and they're making, you know, such a small amount. We can, what we can do is we can buy directly from them, then more of the money goes in their pockets. But we, as a policy, we really need to uh, give them exemptions uh, on taxes. We need to give them, help them with the easements, um, you know, so that they can continue um, and, and not be forced out of, uh, out of business just because the price of uh, doing farming in New York is too high. Mm -hmm. What's that farm that I get my milk from? Something Brook. Ronnie Brook? Yes. Okay. I always go to Hannaford's and get that milk. Okay. And that's, yeah, same yeah. thing. So no middleman. It's just them bottling their own milk and then distributing it to Hannaford's. And Except Hannaford's would just be, it would be the middleman. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Ideally, if you can go to a farmer's market or, uh, you know, whatever, then it's even closer. But it, yeah, I mean, buying much local better is milk. better. Much, yeah. much, much better milk. Absolutely. Love it. Yeah, we'll talk about the number of milk bottles in the refrigerator. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> um, the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. um, should be raised. Well, it, how high? It, it, it's it's already going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this I think this December it goes up to I want to say is it nine forty five, and then the following year it's supposed to go up as as high. The issue with with the minimum wage is that um, there's two, well, there's two issues. One is that 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 the pay is. Um, you know, everything else is going up. Electricity is going up, gasoline is going up, but meanwhile, the minimum wage is still here, and so the people are struggling to pay. Um, the second issue is that there's a lack of jobs, um, and good paying jobs, and so what you end up is, is the jobs that are available are, are low paying, and then the people who are, you know, working two, three more jobs in order to make ends meet, and the quality of life is going down. It really goes back to, you know, what used to be 100 and something years ago, you know, when, when people were working in the factories for 12 hours a day, because now you're working a couple jobs because the pay is lower. Um, I, I do believe that the minimum, that, that the wage people should get is going to, should be higher. Um, I, but at the same time, and so I would support minimum wage going higher. At the same time, I do think um, that a, a high school kid um, does not need to get the same rate as somebody who is older uh, in a minimum wage job. And, and there is uh, legislation in Albany for like a training wage. Um, because, because I do think that we want people to be able to, to receive uh, a decent amount of money so they can live, and the cost of living is high in Hudson Valley. Um, but 
to give that same person who's trying to support a family at the same rate as a high school student, I do think that there is, it would seem a disparity. So I would say somebody that's learning, high school student, um, 16, 17, 18 year olds, um, I think that they could have a lower rate. Immigration? Uh, I believe that the naturalization process uh, needs to be um, reformed in some way. I, I probably could not tell you specifics, but it takes way too long for somebody who desires to be a citizen uh, working in this country uh, to become a citizen. And the fact that it takes so long is a huge deterrent. Um, uh, so that, to begin with, is something that we need to look at. Um, the people who do come uh, into the country uh, lawfully uh, should be encouraged and shouldn't be penalized through, through a bad system. Uh, those that are coming in illegally, um, we need to address it. Uh, I don't know exactly the, the right solution. I do think our borders should be um, um, beefed up. Um, how, I'm not exactly certain on. Uh, the people who are here, though, um, I don't believe that there's consensus on deporting them, and therefore, I think if they're going to be here and we're not going to deport them, then we do need to provide services to them. Um, and that because that basically however they got here if they're not going somewhere um, they're going to be living here a long time and we need to make sure they're educated and we make sure make sure that their needs are being met uh, otherwise you're just kicking the can down the road uh, as far as uh, social services or, or jail costs or anything um, so uh, you know it, we do need to look at our immigration policies but I don't think we should penalize uh, the people that are here and you support the dream man? I don't know enough about it. Um, I would, because I don't know enough about it, I, I would not say I could support it at this point because I don't know enough about it. Legalizing marijuana. Um, I, I, I believe that people can make uh, decisions for themselves, um, uh, and and I'm not sh I'm not up on all of the the background on the dangers of it. I do believe that substance abuse is something that uh, uh, people should avoid. Um, and to, to the fact that marijuana is a considered a gateway drug, uh, I don't think it should be outright, out completely um, legalized, but I do think there are exceptions uh, to the rule. Uh, the medicinal one, medicinal use being one of them. Okay. Have you ever tried it? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's our question. <laughs> they, 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 um, I'm okay with, you know, I would say that, you know, people experimenting with it. I haven't just because I have schizophrenia in my family and that there's a belief that marijuana can trigger schizophrenia. And so uh, personally for me, I don't think it would be the right choice just because uh, I'm old enough now that I haven't, um, you know, you know that usually it's in your, your mid-20s, but I know that a lot of times schizophrenia is believed to be uh, um through genes and genetic, um, and that there is a study, whether it's true or not, that marijuana can lead to it. And so I just, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's not the right choice for me, but if somebody, you know, I'm not opposed to somebody else uh, experimenting or whatever. Do you, do you want to say any more about um, schizophrenia and what you, um, uh, what kind of solutions you'd like to see? see? The, the, the biggest um, issue, and, and this, is a, this is a topic, um, I mean, when, uh, growing up with, uh, you know, my mom having the mental illness, we, we were taught by my dad to not say anything to anybody people wouldn't understand. And, and for years, that's how, you know, we acted in the family. And the same with, um, uh, you know, same with, I compare it to the poverty when we were getting food donations is, you know, kids would come over to the house and we boxes would have the num number on it that we were signed at the church. And, you know, you're always worried what people would think. And with that, that's the stigma. And, until, and while things remain stigmatized, you can't get the results. And what, why I ran for the county legislature five years ago is our hospital, St. Francis, um, had announced that it was closing mental health hospital beds. And when it did, uh, the Poughkeepsie Journal ran an, an article. It's okay, I mentioned them, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Farther enough. We know they exist. Yes. Well, I, they ran an article saying um, that uh, all the job losses that was going to happen, and not one mention of the, the the loss of services to the mentally ill, and that infuriated me. And I wrote a, an op-ed piece. It's where I found my voice. And 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 for anybody who knew me, reading that would be like, why is Mike talking about mental health? Because I never sp once spoken a word about it, and never revealed what was going on with my mom. And that really was the first time I said, look, nobody's speaking up on, on this. Uh, and that's really what propelled me into, into public service because, you know, now I, I saw the need, I recognize it, and now I had to open my mouth. Um, and so with 
uh, as, as I ran for office that year, and I remember within my own uh, party, um, I said I was running for low taxes and I was running on mental health. And one of the members of the party and leadership said, you know, we, are, we don't run on that, and, you know, Republicans. <laughs> and, and I said, well, then find another candidate. And every door I went to, why are you running? Um, and, you know, I'd say low taxes, and everyone would say, oh, yeah, I heard that again. And then I, when I would say mental health, immediately people would listen. And, and one by one, you know, not every house, but most houses, somebody would say, somebody in my family has this, uh, you know, a brother, a sister, a son, a daughter, a parent. And, and more and more, it just, you know, it made me realize I'm not alone. And it's something where I've carried with me because we've we've had battles within our county legislature as far as the funding of mental health clinics and 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 I've argued with people and, and said look these are our friends our family and neighbors the statistics is one in four in adults um, that's a lot um, and you know and not only adults but it's also kids and I know in, in, in Duchess I'm not sure about Columbia and Duchess there's no mental health beds uh, for kids and one so one in four hundred is schizophrenic one in four ment uh, mental health mental health yeah. yeah. It's a serious mental health, a mental health diagnosis. Beyond that, all of us deal with stress. All of us deal with anxiety. All of us deal with uh, depression from time to time. You know, not not mentally ill, but we all deal with moods, and we all have situations that uh, uh, relationship breakups or job losses, or you know, that all of us are affected in one way or the other. That. I believe it's a universal thing. It's not a special interest to talk about mentally ill. It's really something that affects all of us. Although for good reasons, many of us choose not to, to go public with it. Yeah, it's like substance abuse in the 70s, 60s, and mm -hmm. 70s. You kept your mouth shut. Yeah. And, and as long as it stays there, nobody talks about it. And, and in politics, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And so nobody's speaking about it. Therefore, it's not, it's not getting the attention. And you can understand why hospitals are being closed, why services are being cut, because nobody is saying anything. And maybe people are shaking their heads but nobody wants to come forward and say something and, and that's what I've been doing you know is saying no this is bad policy you're doing this you're affecting people um, knowing you know one I'm, I'm vested because of my mom but I know that other families have, are going through similar situations uh, my last question is um, a lot of people in uh, Columbia County um, struggle due to a lack of broadband availability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's hard for businesses to get started. I mean, what's your, you know, how would you take that on? I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the issue. I know even, you know, a lot of times, you know, I'm traveling, I can see where, you know, there's, there's black holes or, you know, cell phone, cell phone service. Um, and, and I do think we need to address it. Um, you know, I, I kind of think, I know where, where I have been in, in Pleasant Valley that there, you know, a couple antennas have popped up over the last couple of years um, and it's gone through the, the town process and they've approved it and neighbors have come out and said their comment. Um, I kind of think that business will take care of it and as an elected official, I could call up places of Verizon or wherever like that and, and try to encourage them. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I don't think it should necessarily be government led, but I do think there's a need and should be addressed. Well, I mean, she's mm -hmm. talking about internet and with mm -hmm. what's going on with um, uh, net neutrality and everything. Mm -hmm. They're trying to make that like a utility. So the government really should be overseeing to make sure everybody has net access. Because this isn't just phones. Okay. This is, this is okay, internet. So this is internet. Yeah, with serious internet problems in this county in certain, okay. in certain spots. So it's being, as far as... It's not available. The services aren't available. Spotty, yeah, really spotty, and not available. Also, and and not, and yeah, it's not big problems with it. Yeah, so yeah. you know, you have businesses that are, you know, the digital world mm -hmm. is is flat, but we have people that can't set up businesses here because they can't reach customers digitally. And here we have a lot of entrepreneurs. Doing right, that. right, and and I can see, I definitely in this day and age I can see how that we had a period a few a month or two ago where or, where um. Mm -hmm. There was no email access. Really? For, for businesses in, in Chatham? Chatham. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chatham. The town, not the village? The village. Really? Really? Even in the village? For uh, days. It was a fair days. point. It was, it was it, not really the same as Anklin because the, Chatham has a provider, mm -hmm. but, Ankh, but fair point went out. Yeah. For days. And it seems to, that happens on a regular basis, I think. Squirrels. Yeah, squirrels. <laughs> But, yeah, that's an issue. So when you say a squirrel, it's, it's that they're chewing the wires, or no? I, we uh, had a power outage that caused some havoc. 
you know, in our newsroom because the squirrel. Oh, okay. <laughs> they said it was a squirrel. Um, that it sounds like when my when my grandfather passed away, we had the, the mass, and then they go to the cemetery, and the cemetery said, "Oh no, we the, you know this problem that the uh, they were digging the hole, and they had a root, so you can't have, couldn't have the burial, and so we had to go back, and 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 then and then we said, well, we have all the family in town, we're going to do it today, and then so we went back to the house at the reception, and then we went out later on, and you know, and, and we get to the cemetery. The nearest tree is all the way back there, so there obviously was no root. It's basically somebody forgot to show up for work, you know. <laughs> there's, there's a root, you know, and so it's a similar story, you know, like you know, like you're looking at it going, "There's no tree." Here, you know? And meanwhile, there's graves all around it, like we're, you know, yeah. yeah. So, um, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, so, uh, the uh, Republicans are in the minority in the assembly. Uh, yes. What uh, is it worth it to run as a Republican? I mean, would you? Would you you have a voice it, it 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 is and and the one is it comes down to you know uh political theory, the representation that, that, you know, the whole point of representation is that somebody is going to represent you and have your voice heard. So even if your, your beliefs are in the minority, um, you know, you're still entitled to representation. Um, secondly, I, I do believe, uh, for me personally, I'm, I'm in, as Kenny Legislator and Duchess, I'm in the majority. We, you know, I see we can get stuff accomplished there. For me to say, why am I going to leave the county and go to the state where I may have a tougher time, um, you know, for me, what makes it worth it is, is because I do believe that my message, specifically on mental health, uh, will appeal to Democrats. Um, and, and I don't believe anybody is currently speaking the things that I speak about and having experiences that I have that I feel I can be effective on that area, which is, you know, really important to me. And I think when I, when I think, I think it can warrant the respect of my colleagues across the aisle. Uh, and I think once I can build up that relationship, I think other areas where we may disagree, um, there may be, I have hope that, you know, that we might be able to reach common ground or I can have the voices heard on issues that we disagree about, which will allow my constituency that, that may not believe their voice is being heard now, there may be able to be impact or influence at that point. I'm good. Sorry, We're good. Oh, I'm, All right. What? What, what kind of philosophy do you teach? I, I teach um, Introduction to Philosophy. It's Philosophical Perspectives. And so I give a survey course. Uh, we start out talking, and these are all uh, freshmen, and it's a required course. Half of them won't be philosophy majors, and I tell them they shouldn't be. Uh, some of them, some of them may be minors, but uh, I teach, kind of teach a philosophy of life. We start out looking at what is the point of education, and just like Common Core, we read John Locke, who talked about education should be all about utility, usefulness. You should be able to get a job, and we look at uh, Newman, who, who says the liberal arts, the cultivation of the intellect, and that conversation from 1600s and 1800s is still going on today. Um, but then we go and look at what is the um, uh, what does it mean to be human? You know, this, uh, the traditional idea of being rational that we're you know intelligent as opposed to animals and plants. And we look at that. Uh, but then we do a, a little bit on logic and reason. And then the whole rest of the course, we look at everything from uh, what does it mean to be happy and look at different ideas. What, what is ethics? Um, how do we define ourselves? The whole idea of existentialism that we're still becoming. Um, you know, and so it, I try to make it relevant to. Uh, their lives now and in the future, as well as bringing in, uh, showing the relevance of bringing in war stories from the legislature, from the courtroom, from hiking in the woods, my own experiences, and it really to just try to show them that's not just some dead I subject. Take that class. Yeah. Do you want to take my class? Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, and actually, um, I do. We do a little bit on Henry David Thoreau, you know, and he talked about, um, you know, deliberate living, the idea of suck the marrow of life experience in the full. And the local naturalist, which is John Burroughs uh, over in Ulster County. This Friday, I'm actually I do I, I do a lot of outdoors and I have a kayak rental business. Um, taking whoever's interested, we're going kayaking Lake Chattake, and then we're gonna uh, it goes to Black Creek. We're gonna park the boats, hike two miles to Slab Slides, which is John Burroughs' house. And while we're there, um, you know, he, he drained a swamp and he actually grew celery. So I'm going to bring celery, we're going to eat celery. And he wrote a book about Walt Whitman. And, he, and Walt Whitman wrote a poem about Lincoln's uh, death. And he used John Burroughs' um, birds to talk. He talked about the hermit thrush. And it was a solitude and the hermit thrush. Uh, and he wrote a whole poem about it. So I'm going to read that poem while we're out there and just give them. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I was like, <laughs> you want to come Friday? I got kayaks. <laughs> 
So you right. know, it's, it's really trying to make it alive for them. But it's gonna be, it's gonna, they're gonna remember it. You know. And the other thing I do is, um, this time of year, you know, you have the acorns, and mm. as I'm campaigning, God, I, I, know. Pile, I pick up the acorns from my pocket, and as they give a right answer, I throw the acorn at the kid, and they look at me like, well, first time I did, like, well, you know. And Aristotle taught that the acorn is act and potency. That acorn has the potential to be a great oak and you know but it doesn't have to act on it and so i throw him and he says you answer the question or you have a lot of potential you act on it give me the acorn and who knows what they do with them or they probably just scratch their head and drop them in my house this guy's weird <laughs> you know that's why my four-year-old picks him up yeah <laughs> he's got a lot of potential he knows it you know? where's your kayak business uh, it's it's operates out of my barn, um, but I do it all over the place. Uh, we did I did four trips uh, in Hudson this year. We went out to that's Nathan's Lighthouse and, and around the island, uh, Wappingers Creek. I have a whole website on, on, on the whole creek is paddable, mm-hmm. and uh, you know I, I have a, where you can put in, where you can take out. I live on the Wappingers Creek in Pleasant Valley. I, I uh, live I, right by it in Wappingers. Oh right, right. Well, um, the Wappingers. I have a boat uh, boathouse on on the lake. And, um, oh, you and, do? Yeah, I, I, I do the summer camp program for the kids uh, and canoes. Uh, and I, I probably maybe 15, 20 trips this summer on the lake. And the lower creek, if you go in by um, uh, was it Creek Road, I think it is, and you go in um, the old highway department garage, and mm-hmm. you go right out to the Hudson and, and go out on Rabbit Island, come back in. It, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful... Yeah, I've always wanted to do that. Bald Eagles. Yeah. Never did it, and I'm so close to it. To tell me when you go. I, mean, I will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go to kayakwappingers.com or I mean, you know, let me see if I'm. I don't think I have a guide business card here, but um, yeah, no, it, it, the Wappingers Creek is beautiful, and it's it's under it's under appreciated. Yeah, I don't have one on me. Um, I got it. Yeah, and kayakwappingers and dot com. Um, is dot com is on the on the um, the creek, and then and that's just a, a educational material for everyone out there. My guide service is Away Adventures. Okay. Away Adventure. Um, so you uh, you have kayaks and you have the teaching. Are those your two main things? I I love Thoreau. Live life to the fullest. I have um I have a law practice, and um, you know I have my law practice. Is it your own? Yes, okay. law office of Michael and Kelsey. Now operates out of my house. Okay. I'm of counsel with two farms, um, so I, they feed some some stuff to me. Uh, some what water. farms? Uh, used to be Cordero and Lewis. It's now Porter, Paul Cordero was by himself. They left. Uh, they lost their big client, which is Hudson Valley Federal Credit Union, who now is with somebody else. And they just contacted me today to do some probate work for them. Uh, and then Paul Supple and Beacon. Okay. So, um, so I, I have the law practice. I teach uh, a couple classes a semester. Uh, county legislator, which is part time, and then during the summer I rent out kayaks. I'm also a licensed guide. Not this week, the following week. I have two hikes planned. There's a, a group of um, uh, older women from Ohio coming out, and we're taking them down one day to um, uh, Rockefeller State down in uh, Terrytown, and then one day to Mohonk. Uh, and then I also, combined with that, put all group in the outdoors. I write monthly for the Berkshire Homestyle Magazine, which is out of Austerlitz, and that's on an outdoor adventure column. Uh, and then I do. Uh, you know uh, Billy Shannon? I know Billy, yep. He used to yeah. write for us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a good guy. He's he's my proofreader, and we've gone kayaking on the Hudson together and, and on the road jam. You ever uh, take the ta- uh, kayak down to New York with him? No, but he no. but he that was my kayak. Oh really? Yeah, because he because he did it once before, and, and it's small kayak. And then I have he called this in May. He said, "Yeah, can I can I borrow one of your large kayaks?" And so so my kayak went around it. I've I've done I've done the Statue of Liberty, and I've done New York City Harbor. Um, and I had that written up. I have an adventure blog. If you want my Kelsey adventures, um, <laughs> you can be entertained. I'm, there, I'm out there, you know. And I and I edited a hiking guide book up in the Adirondacks. So. I suddenly feel very much like a slacker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. I don't sleep. <laughs> so. Great. All right. So we're good. You good? Yeah, I'm good. You know. So. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you for your time. Oh, now, no do we have a number where we can reach you in case John has any questions tonight or anything? Uh, yeah. Somebody is, well, well, like, it won't be tonight, will it? Well, no, 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 just, yeah. just if we need questions, if we have any questions. Yeah. Thank you. There we go, another one. Thank you. Me with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> Winter I grow beards, I snowshoe. Yeah, I'll give you my card. Okay, great. So. All right, good. So we're all set? Great. Okay, great. How far are you from the state police? And uh, Salt Point, pretty close. Probably, let's see, probably four miles. Oh, because if you go to the Taconic Hibernia Road, yeah, right after you cross the creek, yeah, Hibernia Road, I'm three miles in on there. Oh, okay, yeah, all right. So, okay. thank you for coming in. Oh, no problem, really no, appreciate it. Yeah, suck it down. <laughs>
Okay, very good. Good to meet you. Thank yep, you same for your here. time. Yep. You can stop it now, Tom. <laughs> 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 Follow me out of the car, right? Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mike. Yep. Nice to meet you. Yeah. It was good meeting you. Yep, same here. Good luck. All right, thank you. Thanks. Right, thank you.